Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's program, Reprogramming the American Dream with Kevin Scott, CTO of Microsoft and the New York Times' John Markoff. I'm Dan Lewin, CEO of the Computer History Museum. On behalf of the CHM volunteers, members, trustees, and staff, we hope that everyone is well and safe during these unprecedented times. This pandemic will reshape life as we know it the global economy, politics, education, and our workforce. All of these things will undoubtedly change in ways that we don't yet understand. But one thing is certain, our future will rely on technology and our lives will be defined by the technology we create. At CHM, we've made it our mission to decode technology for everyone. It's computing past, digital present, and the future impact on humanity. We're bringing you human-centered stories that explore the promise and perils of technology. We're considering critical questions like those we're asking today about the impact of AI on work and our livelihoods. In the midst of uncertainty, we believe this is the time to begin to shape a better future for humanity. Our programs are made possible through the generosity of our members and donors. And we think it's important for everyone who's interested to opt in. It's really timely and it's just the beginning. If you're not already a member of CHM and are interested in becoming one, please visit and join at our website. Introducing today's speakers is the founding executive director of the museum's exponential center, Marguerite Gong Hancock. Please join me in welcoming Marguerite to the program. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Our program today focuses on this essential question. How can we make artificial intelligence serve us all from here in Silicon Valley to rural America? Right now, there are two prevailing stories about AI. For rural and heartland workers with 20th century skills, a grim tale of steadily increasing job destruction. And for urban knowledge workers in the professional class, a utopian tale of productivity and convenience. Is there a third way for the path forward? Kevin Scott, born and raised in rural Darcy, Virginia, and now Executive Vice President and Chief Technology Officer of Microsoft, argues that there is a more nuanced, complex, and ultimately hopeful version of the future, a future where AI can benefit us all equitably. Is it possible for AI to create opportunity for everyone to revolutionize the workplace and help solve some of the most vexing global problems? How do we ensure um, and how do we work to ensure that the continued development of AI allows us to keep this American dream alive? And whether we're an AI expert or product developer, an entrepreneur, investor, uh, policymaker, or individual citizen, what role can we play? The museum's thrilled that Kevin's here to discuss these questions as well as tell his story in a conversation with John Markoff, Pulitzer Prize, a uh, winning technology writer, research affiliate at Stanford University, and longtime friend of the museum. As is our tradition here at CHM, I'll introduce our speakers with five numbers. Kevin Scott. Zero, number of stoplights in Kevin's hometown in Gladys, Virginia. One, the U.S. route passing through Gladys, Virginia. Three, 3D printers in Kevin's shop. 20, the average number of books read per month by Kevin and his family. Five, the projects in progress in Kevin's workshop right now, including a, vi a vacuum siphon uh, coffee machine with an AI interface. It's a pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to you, Kevin. Thank you all so much for having me today. And now to introduce John Markoff with five numbers. 3,000 plus the tech articles written for the New York Times. 42 years of writing about technology and science for Pacific News Service, San Jose Mercury News and the New York Times. 1993, the year he wrote the first ever piece on the World Wide Web, four, the number of Pulitzer Prize nominations before winning in 2013, and five, the number of books written on the history of people and their relationships with computer. John, it's always a pleasure. Thank you for joining us today. Kevin and John, we look forward to your conversation. Over to you. We've taken it for granted, uh, I think, since the beginning of the last cen century that each generation of Americans has done better than the last and yeah. will do better. And now that seems to be up for grabs. Uh, and, and maybe that is part of why it needs to be reprogrammed. 
comparing like whether or not you've succeeded the American dream based on, you know, your benchmarking to some previous generation, like it's certainly been a useful thing over time, but I, I've i always looked at it more as sort of an, you know, an in individual thing and sort of how do we make sure that people have access to opportunity, that they have the fundamental things that they need in their lives to not spend all of their time worrying about subsistence uh, and so that we can really get them into the like top tiers of Maslow's hierarchy of needs where they're, you know, finding their creativity, they're doing constructive things, they're building the infrastructure that the world needs in order for civilization to make progress. Um, where does where does reprogramming fit into it? Why did you pick that word? <laughs> well, I uh, I I do think, and this is something that uh, you know you you know better than I do because you've been so uh, artfully covering the technology industry f for so long now. Um, I, I think we we do have this reality where more and more of what the future looks like is being informed by what technology we all have access to. And I, I believe, like when I'm thinking about AI and machine learning in particular, it, it really is, uh, it, it's, it's a tool. Uh, it's a tool that we can employ to do good things and we can employ to do bad things. Uh, but in, in a sense, we, we really do have to think about, uh, you know, using these tools, uh, almost in the way that a software engineer would, like to sort of program uh, what the structures of society are gonna look like. Uh, I mean, so that, that's why I chose uh, reprogramming. Like I think more and more, like the choices that we're gonna make are these complicated blends of policy and technology. And you sort of can't think about one in isolation from the other. And you have to really be thinking about how you're programming the whole mix. Yeah. Uh, let's start by talking a little bit about how how you got to where you are today. Um, you know, um, I got the sense that you were a voracious reader as a child yeah. growing up. Um, did that? To what extent did that include science fiction? Um, uh, it, it was my favorite thing to read. And and do you think it shaped your worldview? Yeah, it absolutely did. I'm asking because. Um, a while ago, when I was working on a book on robotics and AI, I began to discover that there were a vast number of the people who were technologists who built these AI systems went into the field after they had read some particular book that captured their imagination. And what comes to mind in particular is Rod Brooks, an early roboticist, and Jerry Kaplan, an early AI guy, both decided to go into the field of AI um, after they um, saw Space Odyssey 2001, and they yep. decided they wanted to build HAL. Now, I yep. saw that movie, and that wasn't my reaction. <laughs> but but it, it is interesting, isn't it? I mean, do you think, yeah. I mean, did you read Asimov? Did you read Heinlein? Was, were those yeah. the guys who sort of framed your view of the world? Yeah, Asimov more than Heinlein, but, uh, you know, I, I think it was, like, I, I, when I read most of these stories, the thing that I got out of them is, uh, look, here, here are these fictional worlds in the future where humanity is able to do all of these interesting things because of the technology and the science that powers the, the worlds that these characters are living in. And I just thought it was really fascinating. Like as a curious person, like anything that sort of expands the frontier of our knowledge and like gives us new horizons to discover seemed like the most fascinating, wonderful thing in the world and like something I wanted to be a part of, uh, part of the development of. Yeah, I, I've thought a lot about that because, you know, the science fiction that we, you and I grew up on was really pretty optimistic about the world. Yeah. I mean, that generation, you know, and then I, I read science fiction, I think until I overdosed on science fiction when I was rereading the Asimov trilogy for the second time when I was a sophomore in college and I didn't come back to it until cyberpunk. Yeah. And by that time, it had reframed itself, and science fiction was dystopian instead of utopian. Yeah. And I wonder often whether that's not part of our problem at this point. Yeah, I, I mean, it's one of the reasons why I chose to write a book of all things. Um, it's, it's not that I had any sense that I was going to be uh, good at writing a book or that it was going to be an especially good use of time. But the, the thing that I, I saw that was missing is you know, a, a pragmatic lens on AI uh, and encouragement uh, for 
just people everywhere, not just the technologists, that you can have an understanding of how these technologies work, even if you don't have a graduate degree in mathematics, and just sort of stories that tell how the technology can be used in ways that aren't the you know the, the things that we're reading about in the news um and and i think that's what science fiction at least did for me when i was a kid is uh it it gave me a way to imagine a world that was uh constructive and optimistic yeah well let me push on that a little bit more um a simple question you um i think you describe yourself as a bit of a nerd um in, <laughs> in when you were a, a, a youngster but I was thinking about it, and I thought it can't be something as simple as growing up with the Encyclopedia Britannica. What what set you apart and made you? Um, I, I have. I, well, let me take it one step farther. You, you talk about the influence your grandfather had, and yeah. he had an extremely mechanical bent. And I wondered whether that wasn't part of the chemistry. Yeah, I, I think probably that more than anything else. Uh, like I grew up, like we were poor, but. Um, yeah, my my mother was a, a and still is a huge reader, and so books were a part of our lives. And like we just, you know, we because she was a reader, she would take us to the library. She like one of my prized early possessions was a library card. Uh, so I had a I had a, a public library card probably when I was six years old, uh, and she'd go to the library and just turn me loose and say, "Go check out whatever you want," and I, I would just go grab these random selections of books off the shelves, uh, take them home, read everything, and then beg her to take me back to the library the next week. And then, you know, and then my my grandfather, like both both of them, like my uh, maternal grandfather in particular owned uh, an appliance repair shop. And so he had this, you know, sort of dusty little shop that was in downtown Brookneal, Virginia. Um, like it's still, like I, I, I sort of so clearly see it in my head. It was like my favorite place to be. And it was just full of these machines that were in states of disrepair that he was working on, things that people had just brought there and abandoned that had no hope of getting fixed. And uh, like all of my grandfather's tools. And it was just fascinating. Like I always, uh, I frustrated my mother constantly when I was a little kid because I was, uh, I wanted to know how everything worked. And so I would take everything apart and with varying degrees of success would be able to reassemble them. <laughs> and so there was, and thankfully she, her father could fix most of what I uh, broke uh, while I was doing my investigations. Uh, but it, it was, so, yeah, a, a peculiar set of things, right? Yeah, that's so. That's so. I get this picture of, of you, or the port, portrait you drew of yourself as a curious young man with a Radio Shack computer at a certain point. Um, if there were 250 people in Gladys, maybe there were 50 or 100 kids. How many of other Kevin Scotts were there when you were growing up? Not, not too many kids. So my graduating high school class at William Campbell High School was 62 students, uh, and William Campbell served. Gladys and Naruna and parts of Brookneal. So it was uh, like one of the two high schools in Campbell County. Yeah. So um, like not not many in Gladys. Yeah. And so then, you know, you also said that you were the first in your family to go to college. Yeah. And I got the sense it was because it was a priority of your parents that you it went, was. went to college. Yeah, my my dad had had an interesting story. So he um, he was a both my mom and my dad were really good high school students. Um, and at, at the time and in the place, uh, like it wasn't expected that my mom would go to uh, like a four year school. So she went off to uh, like what at the time they, they called a secretary's uh, college. And so it was, she got uh, like a, a professional certificate and uh, in, in sort of general office skills. And then uh, she was a bank teller for a while. My dad, got admitted to a four year school. And, you know, because he was just tired of going to school, he turned down admission and then almost immediately got drafted to go to Vietnam. And I think he regretted that decision his entire life uh, and just sort of imagined that he could have had a different life and one that he would have liked better than the one that he had if he had made different choices. Now, I don't know if that's true. Like I, I looked at his life and there was a an enormous amount of beauty and dignity in the work that he did. And he had a huge positive impact on the people in his life, but he was very determined that I was gonna to go to college. Yeah. 
Well, sorry, I mean, you tell a story that, um, you know, it's about this sort of the disconnect between rural America and places like Silicon Valley is shape is a place you know really large in your in your book and I was I was thinking about and looking at that and I went and looked at um, for example I mean it's it's complex but the current numbers um, Virginia where you grew up is actually ranked um, eighth in K twelve education and fourteenth in college education while California which is fourth in college education is actually ranked thirty seventh yeah. nationally so I thought well wait I mean there's there are other things going on here and yeah um, I mean v Virginia is a it's an unusual state so you you have uh, in northern Virginia near DC uh, it it looks a lot like Silicon Valley in a bunch of ways so like high population density the schools are good like one of the best science and technology schools in the entire country is uh, is in northern Virginia it's called uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, High School uh, and like it, it, we I, I got to go to this small governor's school in Lynchburg, which is the nearest big town to where I lived. And like when we did all of our science competitions, we would compete with TJ. Uh, um, but so it, it, it's very interesting. So and you have these little pockets uh, in the rest of the state. So there's Richmond, the state capital, which is um, you know, very urban and the schools are, are good there. Uh, you have Charlottesville where the University of Virginia is and the schools are very good there. And then like the rest of the state, it, it, like, and then there's Newport News and Norfolk. Uh, um, and then you have just huge parts of the state that are uh, very sparsely populated. Uh, and the schools are like, the schools aren't bad. Like I, I wouldn't say that the schools are the problem. The problem, the problem that I wish we could go solve uh, if you're sort of thinking about like how do you get all of the folks in all of the parts of Virginia fully participating in a digital future. It's about, uh, you know, sort of ubiquitous consistent broadband access and I think it's about role models. So when you're sitting in one of these rural schools and you're imagining what your future is like you sort of look around at, at your family and your friends and the people that you admire in your community and like most of those people have this career inertia that doesn't have anything to do with technology. The, the role model thing is such a big deal. I mean, in sort of trying to pick apart your trajectory. Uh, and when I saw your grandfather, it just really jumped out at me because it's something I see a lot when I always ask people who I, when I was a reporter in Silicon Valley, I would ask people, you know, who was in your family background? And there was always a physicist or a technologist or an engineer. Yep. There was, there was, and that was the role model thing. The other thing that is important here to me that I don't, that, that frustrates me because I don't see an easy path is that you seem to need parents who are hungry to have their kids go to college. And that's a cultural thing. And I, I, I'm kind of at a loss to how to do that on, an, an, on a national scale or on a scale that'll make a difference. Yeah, I, I, I do a anecdotally at least with my my family um, and and the friends that I have back in 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 Gladys and in Campbell County. Like I know that many 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 people do have this desire for their kids. Um, and and I tell the story at the end of the book. So in the middle of the book, I, I go visit these. Uh, guys that I grew up with, the Bass brothers who yeah. have transitioned from tobacco farming to sod farming. Um, and, uh, you know, W.B. Bass's son, um, Hunter, went to college like he went to like the other uh, high school in Campbell County. So Rustburg High uh, is so different than mine, but like, you know, very, very close, uh, close by uh, geographically. And he, you know, he got a degree in computer engineering and he chose to stay in Lynchburg. Like there are just more technology jobs there now than uh, when I was a kid. And so that's the tension. Like my my dad wanted me to go to college and he wanted me to be able to find a job that was uh, local. And I couldn't figure out how to do that. Um, <laughs> and 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 I think, you know, if you had both of those things, it would get better. Like if if parents are choosing like, oh, you know, my my kid's going to go to college and then they're going to, you know, move off to the big city somewhere and I'm never going to see them again. Like, I think it gets a little harder for them to sort of imagine that future for their children. Yeah. Um, I wanted to also ask about your path to the world of AI. Um, you 
as a computer scientist, you were really doing more blocking and tackles, tackling stuff. I mean, you began in languages. Yep. Um, you did a lot of infrastructure stuff early on. And then you you came to, I guess you got this project at Google that was involved with machine learning. But even then, it was about a decade early, wasn't it? I mean, if it was 2003 that you were doing yeah. your... Yeah, I mean, you, did you even think of it as AI then? Or did you just think of it as... No, I, so, you know, the funny thing, the funny thing with my background is we were on the tail end of one of the AI winters when I was in graduate school. And so... There were people doing artificial intelligence, but they were like, you know, I don't know, they probably thought I was weird because I was a compiler guy, but uh, like I thought they were weird uh, for doing this thing that had just like blown up in spectacular fashion and like the the type of AI that they were doing. Uh, and again, like I'm not trying to, like I'm sure there are people listening here who will like take offense at this, but like the, the type of AI that they were doing, like I just didn't understand how it would scale. It was a bunch of, you know, planning and, you know, like a lot of things that heavily, uh, you know, like involved all of this curation and heuristics. And and I was like, yeah, this just isn't super appealing to me. The, the thing that uh, like people weren't doing much of, and I don't even know whether they had coined the phrase, I'm guessing they had, but it just wasn't a popular thing was machine learning. So, you know, how you, how you like take vast repositories of data and try to you know pull some structure out of it uh, so that you can solve a particular set of problems. And that was the thing that that was my first real project at Google. So we had a we had a set of ads review things that we had to do where it was blocking ads from being running and sort of jamming a bunch of revenue up. And like we had very smart people doing a bunch of mind numbingly repetitive tasks. And uh, we built some what now would be very, very simplistic machine learning uh, systems to go solve these problems. And like that to me was fascinating. Yeah. So uh, the, the trajectory there from um, the field of AI going from logic to rules to uh, to machine uh, to neural nets, um, machine yep. learning systems, um, there are fads. And I was wondering, so right now we're in a situation where those who have the most data seem to win. Um, if you're a, a, a Google or a Microsoft or a, or a nation state and you have access to lots of data, that works to your advantage. But I just wondered, um, things change. There yes. are these people who argue um, for uh, algorithms that can reason based on small data. Now, so far, there haven't been any wins, but if something like that turned out to be a technological breakthrough, it would really change the, potentially change the, have you, you know, out of Microsoft research, do you see any promise for things that might reset the? Yeah, look, I, I think we, we've we actually had a reset in the past uh, two years that we, uh, we haven't started talking about super broadly. I mean, so like, I, I think Kaifu Lee wrote this, you know, wonderful book that, you know, he put a stake in the ground that like, you know, it's supervised machine learning, like, you know, folks with lots of data win, like, you know, deep neural networks are at diminishing marginal returns and it's all about the data. Like, and that's probably like a too coarse a paraphrase of his book, but, uh, it, you know, it was sort of the thrust of the argument. But the thing that's changed just in the past two years is that we now have um, a set of algorithmic techniques um, that, um, are either completely unsupervised or mostly unsupervised that if you're able to throw enough compute at a problem and you have access to like open vast repositories of data like the public web, you can learn unbelievable things. Like most of the like big advances in natural language processing over the past two years have been because of these big new um, unsupervised learning models. So they're still DNNs, but like you, you basically thrown away the, the, the need to do quite as much data labeling as you would otherwise. And in some cases you, you don't need to do any data labeling. Um, and so then it becomes less about access to like the label training data, which you can get either directly or indirectly as people interact with your technological systems. And so scale matters a lot. Um, to, you know, you, you basically need either access to large amounts of compute because like that's the thing that limits how, uh, how effective you can make the models or you need people to sort of think about the models themselves as platforms and to open them up because transfer learning now actually works uh, with them. So if you have the model, you can 
deploy it in hundreds of different tasks, uh, but somebody has to give you the model that they've spent a ton of money training with their massive amounts of compute. Well, let me let me ask you about that. Um, the, the, the language models in particular that are emerging now and are and are open and out there and are being experimented with are, are just fascinating to me because they're kind of like Swiss Army knives that have a million different applications. And I think we're just beginning to see their impact on the world. So let me ask first, um, What's Microsoft going to do? They, you have a very large model. Maybe it's the largest current model called Turing. What, let's see. Uh, it, Turing NLR. Turing, yeah. And uh, have you guys? Are you going to turn it loose in the world? What, what, what will you do with it? Yeah, I think we probably are going to open it up pretty soon. Uh, in fact, there might be <laughs> there might be an announcement uh, <laughs> uh, com coming at some point in the not too distant future. Uh, um, but yeah, look, I think it's really crucially important, and this is one of the points that I make in the book, is that um, we, we really do need to be thinking about all the ways in which we can make machine learning a platform that is accessible for other people to use. And so that I'm actually excited that you now actually have the ability to train these big models, and they are Swiss Army knives, uh, and that uh, you know we will be able to put them into the hands of lots and lots of people so that they can do things with them that I can't even imagine. Like that's really exciting, and it's it is hopefully like once we get things working, it will be much much less expensive than this uh, supervised approach, where like a lot of the expense and uh, a lot of the expenses in gathering that label training data, or you have to have a platform that is at just massive scale uh, in order to get enough sort of second order labels to do things. So like clicks or, uh, you know, like social actions or whatnot. Right. So I, that, that takes us to the, the sort of the other half of your book. And, and you know, I, I, I really... Um, appreciated the fact that you had a nuanced view of the of the impact of AI on the workforce. But the language models for me bring us to the point where we're going to have to start to make some of the decisions that you talk about. And, and, and let me see if I can frame it um, in, in a way that uh, we can talk about. Uh, so um, one of the places where our economy has grown since the Second World War is in the creation of jobs where people um, answer questions or give information or sell things via the telephone. I mean, I, you know, first of all, it was operators and then it was customer support people. I mean, millions and millions of jobs. So then all of a sudden, as natural language systems make progress, you're going to have to make choices about how to deploy this technology. Yep. Um, and I, I, let me, let me put the hypothetical to you because it might be something you face as the CTO of Microsoft. Um, you can um, develop this technology and deploy it in the call center application where you either replace the call center operator or you augment the call center operator. And so for the longest time, I've wondered, well, you as the CTO of Microsoft might want to do the right thing, um, you know, and you can, you can make that case. And yet your customer might be looking at it from strictly a cost perspective. And, and you know, how, how, how do you solve that, that problem in the chain going forward? Yeah, I, again, I think it's about helping people think through how they can best serve the needs of all of the constituents that are wrapped around their business. So there's, you know, like we, we talk a lot about shareholder value and like how to optimize that. But you have employees, you have customers, you have it, like the, the communities in which your products are used. So it's like a very complicated set of dynamics that I think you have to manage. Like the call center is like a really good thing. Like I think you are absolutely right. There are uh, there are going to be people who are only thinking about short-term cost savings because like all of their incentives are stacked up in this very short-term way. And you know, it, it's actually not perfect right now. I think very few people are able to build a satisfying customer service experience based on the current uh, natural language technology and like completely getting rid of human beings. But you know, the day might come in the next five years where uh, you know it's 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 possible. But the the people that I see getting um, getting ahead are like using this augmentation approach where you know and there's I, like i have this beautiful anecdote so like someone whose name i can't uh, i can't mention just because of confidentiality uh reasons but um you know so someone who is running a business who has a substantial 
customer service element. And they had gotten to this point where they couldn't make progress on improving customer service by investing more dollars, like no matter like who, which customer support agents they hired or like how they were thinking about, you know, optimizing workflows or whatnot, like they couldn't put another dollar into their customer service investments and get more customer satisfaction out. And so it had sort of plateaued and they started using um, sort of chatbot technology and some natural language things in a nuanced way. They said, what if I were able to take all of the tier one customer support, so just the simple question answering and the routing uh, and give that to an agent, like an AI agent. Um, and then I free up all of my human customer support representatives to connect with humans, to be empathetic, to you know, do the real problem solving of like how to, you know, resolve these like very complicated and fuzzy issues. Uh, and so th he, he was suddenly able to like change the calculus of his whole investment. He like got to the point where because he had this new point of leverage, he was able to get uh, more customer satisfaction per new dollars that he was investing. Uh, the customer service agents were happier because they they were actually able to use their IQ uh, and like you know, just do the things that they are uniquely situated to do. And like the customers were happy because they're, you know, that, you know, they were getting a better experience. And so like, I think if we encourage people to think about things that like, I think that's the way to create long-term value. Like it really is. Uh, and, and, you know, you're not going to be able to prevent everyone uh, without some regulation, uh, which I think might be a reasonable thing to do to try to capture uh, this short term value. But it's almost always going to be, uh, I think, to the detriment of long term value creation if you do that, if you just sort of forget that like there is no AI system that exists or that's on the horizon that is a complete substitute for a human being and the you know the human to human interactions that we have in our daily lives yeah you know when you think about these things it begins to get madly nuanced um one of the other sort of hypothetical questions that i pose um has to do with um if you are using augmentation approaches with ai technology in the healthcare field do you want to augment doctors or do you want to augment physicians assistants? It occurs to me that if we had more PAs with AI, um, it might it might be better in terms of the cost of healthcare than augmenting doctors. Yeah, I, I think healthcare is one of the most fascinating, uh, fascinating things to be thinking about, like particularly now with the with the the pandemic. Um the the you know the, the as I started thinking about these problems when I was writing the book, it just sort of occurred to me that like where we get ourselves into trouble as a society is where we uh, we get trapped into zero sum thinking, where we've got a finite um, number of resources, and you know we we then are thinking about how we divide up the slices of this finite size pie, and like we can't think about how to resolve the constraints, uh, whereas. You know, if you can use technology in clever ways, you can turn these zero sum games into non zero sum ones where you create abundance and relax the constraints. And I think I think the the, the healthcare example is a good one. So like it it it, it already is possible with um, smart watches and fitness bands like things that can sort of read off your heart tick data that we can build with DNN models. Um, uh, diagnostic capability that can determine whether or not you've got atrial fibrillation, whether you've got hypertension, whether you've got type 2 diabetes, uh, like a bunch of things you can just sort of with clinical levels of accuracy predict from this noisy data that's coming off of these devices that increasingly have biometric sensing. And, and that is not going to replace a cardiologist. What it basically does is it, it creates a world in which you know, now you've got 100 million consulting cardiologists who are looking at the cardiac health of like everybody like in real time and are telling you before you are even possible to know that you're sick, that something is wrong when you can go get treatment or like maybe even just modify your behaviors uh, where you're likely to like pose less costs to the healthcare system and like have better healthcare outcomes for yourself. Like that's, that is like an awesome thing. 
it occurs to me that um, the pandemic might be one of those moments where uh, AI has the possibility of proving its value to society. I, I, you know, I focused in just my reading and a little bit of my reporting on the stuff that's going on at the Allen AI Institute. They have a yep. tool called Semantic Scholar, but I wondered if there are things in, in Microsoft is doing with these tools that you might call out. Yeah, I mean, we we actually are uh, working with the Allen Institute and like we've collaborated with them on uh, Semantic Scholar. So we've got a bunch of things that we're doing uh, to try to uh, ingest and understand all of the literature that's being published, uh, either peer reviewed or in preprint right now to help people have better information resources. The, the really fascinating thing that I'm seeing though, uh, and like this is prior to you know COVID-19 had been one of the big thrusts of my uh, my year was getting more involved in where biology intersects with machine learning, and there is a lot of stuff there. So a lot of the things that people are doing in protein engineering are uh, like highly leveraging machine learning in order to uh, you know shortcut some of the computationally complex things that happen in protein folding simulation. Yeah. Um, there's just a bunch of things in molecule design that uh, that is, you know, heavily benefiting from machine learning. And, and in fact, like there's this pattern that I've seen. Like if you read Science or Nature every week, you will in almost every week of the publication now see someone in the basic sciences deploying a machine learning technique in an interesting way where. It's almost like a new calculus. Like we we have like reached, you know, in a way, uh, you know, with our traditional mathematics, and this will really aggravate the mathematicians. But like we we reached the limit of our ability in many cases to faithfully model physical systems uh, analytically, or even with you know traditional numerical uh, simulation techniques. And a lot of people are figuring out now that you can substitute one of these analytical models for a physical system with a deep neural network that's been trained with reinforcement learning or, you know, some other technique. And like you can get it to more faithfully, you know, simulate the physical system than you could with your traditional, you know, nonlinear partial differential equations or whatever you're using to do the modeling. It's yeah. awesome. Yeah, I've watched that stuff closely and just maybe uh, parenthetically to mention that there is this group, I think they're close to UCSF, that has this uh, tool called Quarantine at Home, mm -hmm. which allows you to run some of these modeling systems for um, solving the problems of, I yeah. guess, finding small molecules that will block COVID reproduction or... Yeah, and, and then like there's that. there's Folding at Home, which is like yes. in, in, a, in a distributed fashion, like built what amounts to the world's largest supercomputer that's doing right now protein folding for the, you know, the spike, uh, you know, glycoprotein for uh, for SARS-CoV-2. And it's it's really fascinating what, what you're able to do now. Yeah. Look, I, let me ask you a progress uh, question. You know, I have I, I was active as a as a daily reporter up until the end of 2016, following the progress of the field, and I have a sense that we went through this period with um, machine learning technology where we captured a lot of the low hanging fruit, and there were these dramatic increases in vision and speech and related areas over a half a decade long period. Am I am I right in suggesting that things have gotten a little slower as we've as we've reached this you know the low hanging fruit are gone now? Yeah, I think that you know we we have certainly plateaued with uh, computer vision, like the this sort of first order computer vision and the first order speech recognition stuff. Uh, but like I think part of that is just because they're already quite good. Um, we really have seen like a lot of progress with natural language processing and understanding over the past two years. Like that, I, I haven't seen, I haven't seen progress this fast in the entire time that I've been paying attention to that area of research, which is almost 20 years now. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it reminds me a little bit about like what happened with speech recognition as soon as you went from you know hidden Markov models and you know uh, uh, yeah a. a bunch of techniques like that to deep neural networks uh, in you know the 2012-2013 time frame. So I think there are places where we you know where we're still making progress and there are places where um, you know folks rightly point out where we've made very little progress. Uh, so 
common sense reasoning and some of the things about navigating the world, like our most sophisticated AIs are not even as good as a toddler. Uh, and I think that's frustrating and it's a thing that we should be looking at in greater detail. Also, there's, you know, the the just sort of the energy uh, differential between biological learning and artificial learning is unbelievable. Like the amount of, of energy that you spend training a 17 billion parameter model uh, is like for the result you get is way more than a human brain spends uh, building a language model. <laughs> Well, well, given that, I, let me jump to the sort of the obvious scientific, uh, science fiction question. Where, where are you with the question of whether we will be able to build um, what is known as an artificial general intelligence as opposed to making progress in discrete AI fields? Yeah, I, I think the, yeah, the AGI stuff is really fascinating. Like we, uh, you know, we, we Microsoft have partnered with OpenAI, which is one of the uh, one of the most formidable research groups pushing on the on the problem. Um, I think it's very hard with any sort of accuracy to predict when you're going to get artificial general intelligence like the 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 all of these Turing Award winners and the you know luminaries of the you know the, the computer science profession who met in Dartmouth in the summer of 1955 and like coined the term artificial intelligence. Uh, you know, they, they thought that everything should have been already solved decades ago. Uh, and, you know, we've gone through a whole bunch of boom and bust cycles uh, from 1955 through the, the present uh, that have shown us that we're not always really great at predicting when like these big step functions are going to happen. Um, I, I think it's I, I think it's going to happen. Uh, like, I, I don't think that there's anything so mysterious about a biological brain that is beyond our ability to emulate. Um, but I think I, I don't see it happening on like any sort of predictable time horizon. Well, let me um, ask a sort of a sub, what could be interpreted as a sub question of that. Do you think that quantum computers will be doing anything practical while you're still CTO of Microsoft? I'm trying to get a horizon, a time frame. <laughs> Yeah, I hope so. And, yeah. and look, and the, and the thing that I just said about AGI, like I think it's like one of the most worthy uh, worthy pushes in the entire world to like be going after it. And I think as we have looked to solve the artificial general intelligence problem for the past sixty years, that like that is one of the primary things that is carrying the whole field forward. So like all of this useful stuff drops out of it and it's fascinating and I love it. Uh, it's just like, I'm not gonna try to be Nostradamus here and predict, uh, you know, when it's coming. Yeah, well, and if you flip the question, I mean, I've I've always thought of the uh, the Turing test as actually being a test of human gullibility rather than anything <laughs> on the actual computational side. But Microsoft in particular has run to what, from a societal impact of these technologies. I mean, you know, Microsoft's two experiments, um, one was Tay, which was yeah. an American, had a bad outcome. The other was Zhao Ice in, in, in China, which had to me a fascinating sociological, uh, has fascinating, fascinating sociological implications. You know, millions of Chinese having extended conversations with the machine. Yep. Um, I still find the movie Her as being the most, of all the science fiction movies, the most interesting, uh, intellectually interesting. Yep. And I wonder if you've thought about the consequences, if we if we, if we have a step function increase in natural language understanding and we can ha build these conversational machines, what will its consequences be for society? Well, I, I am guessing, like, so if you if you had asked me, uh, like, whether or not I think we're uh, close to having a computer that can pass the Turing test, like, I, I think, uh, I, I think I can see the time horizon where that happens. Um, but I, I, I think as soon as it happens, it will be just like a computer beating the world's grandmaster at chess or the computer beating the you know the world go champion or like any of these other things like we will just sort of change you know the high watermark for what we consider the you know the equivalence of artificial and human intelligence and like that's one of the big problems we've got right now is like we don't really have outstanding quantitative definitions of what human intelligence actually is um 
So, you know, a lot of this stuff is com confusing and like there, there are all sorts of like these weird false equivalences that that I think drives some of the hype cycles. You sort of see uh, uh, like a piece of machine learning software beat the Go, uh, you know, Go champion. You're like, oh, we, we must be like right on the cusp of, uh, you know, general intelligence, which, you know, isn't necessarily the right way to be thinking about things. Um, but, you know, I, I do think the, the I, I've thought about this a lot about what it means to our humanity as these computers get more and more uh, connected. And I, I had this, <laughs> I had this, you know, so the, the, only in Silicon Valley do these things happen. It was like a dinner where uh, uh, Yuval Noah Harari was there and, you know, like a bunch of your now colleagues at Stanford. And we, we were having this conversation like, uh, can a, can a artificial intelligence produce meaning? Uh, can it, uh, can it have, can it develop a real emotional connection with uh with a human being and like my argument is you know when i sit down and listen to a piece of classical music like murray pariah playing uh you know chopin's g minor ballad uh like i get goosebumps every time and it's not about the notes in the piece uh like someone else can play that those same notes in a different way and i have a different emotional reaction to it and like part of it is about me thinking about Murray and like his path and like what he must be thinking when he's playing and like something about the way he's playing is like really deeply resonating with me that you know probably isn't resonating with you know other people who are listening to this they're like oh you know classical I mean my children listen to this they're like what well, dad why are you playing this crap <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, you know, like I'm, I'm having this deeply moving experience, and my children think it's garbage. So, I, I, I think that, uh, I think that there is something about like human to human interaction that, like, really is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a thing that we crave. And I don't know that you can substitute out uh, like a machine for one half of that connection. Yeah. I don't even know if you want it, right? Yeah. Like. We, we, we have plenty, and so, it, and it's not one of those places where we have scarcity. So, like, in my mind, you, you know, we should be thinking about, like, how does, how does AI come in and help us solve problems where we have scarcity, like, where there's not enough, like, there's plenty of human connection to be had. Yes, yes. I, I'm, we're coming, we're down to the last four minutes of, of our time together, and I really wanted to, you do have some, I think, very powerful ideas at the end of your book about sort of how to get from here to there. Um, you talk about these these principles for for the development of AI symptoms. I tried to boil them down to four words. Um, you have four sort of foundational columns. Um, that AI development, the way I interpreted what you were saying was that it should be open, inclusive, human-centered, and beneficial. And, and I thought that was a really, I mean, you know, for framing the problem, that's a, a, it's a, a great way of looking at it. The, the challenge for me is, is implementation. Yeah. So, you know, so how do you take those and sort of embed them into the culture of a, a company? And I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. You, you do in your book. Yeah, I, I mean, I can, I, I think... Again, AI and machine learning and like all of these automation technologies are, are tools. There's nothing magical about them at all. And how we how we choose to use them is, you know, is it's choice. Um, and so I, I think you characterize things like spot on, like if I, sh I should have uh, should have sent you a, 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 a manuscript uh, <laughs> before we hit publish. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's a very concise way of, uh, of describing things. So, look, I think it's it, it is all of us uh, sort of collectively in the role that we have with the development of, of machine learning and with technology in general, uh, sort of accepting responsibility for um, for how things play out. So, if you are a, a researcher working on machine learning like i think you have to have these four things in the back of your mind when you are developing what you're doing like you have to think about the the negative consequences as well as the positive like you you have to think about mitigations for the negative as you're developing things like you you don't need to let that stall you out from developing things but like you also can't just push it under the under the carpet and pretend that it doesn't exist um 
you know, I think as as people who are making decisions, like engineering managers or leaders or CEOs, company executives, boards, uh, like when you are directing technology teams about what to do, uh, like you you have to keep all of these things at at top dead center. And like I I know that we we do at Microsoft, like we really do challenge people to sort of think about all four of these things as we're we're developing these uh, these tools. Um, you know, it's some of the some of the things are easier for us because we have a business model where like we we're a platform company. And so by and large, we don't get paid unless we make something that is useful for somebody else who is trying to make something like make their business run better, make a piece of technology that they are going to repackage and sell using some of our technology. Uh, and so that really does like business model can sort of influence how you are thinking about the development of a technology like uh, like AI. But it, but like maybe and so, so I don't mean to be drawn on, but like I think maybe the most important thing is like I think everybody should feel that there's nothing so complicated about machine learning that it's uh, like best left to experts to understand all of this stuff and to like make good decisions and good policy decisions. I think everybody needs to understand it just a little bit so that they can have their voice uh, be involved in all of these decisions that we're making, especially the policy ones. That's great, Kevin. I, we are just now at the top of the hour, and although I have about a dozen more questions I want to ask you, I'm going to actually uh, step back and and turn uh, and open the 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 questioning up, uh, which I think Daniel Lewin, um, who's the the head of uh, CHM, is going to run. Daniel, do you want to step back in? Yeah, thanks, John and Kevin. Sure. This is really really terrific. I've been taking uh, inventory of the audience questions and has some that I think um, you've touched on, but maybe you can go a little deeper. In particular, um, there's a sort of accumulated interest about um, following the money. You make reference in your book to um, really understanding, you know, the implications of AI in our lives. And you just left off on that point that, that John just teed up about looking at business models. So at this moment in time, where should we be paying attention? How do we follow the money? Who's making money? Yeah, look, I think the um, so I, I I think it's it's pretty obvious, uh, you know, who's who's making money. Like I'll I'll just sort of talk about uh, like my my own businesses that I've run. So. Uh, I, I was uh, the head of technology at a company called AdMob that uh, did mobile advertising. So we used a bunch of machine learning uh, techniques to do things as simple as CTR prediction, which led to advertisers getting more relevant leads, uh, users getting more relevant ads, and uh, like the the publishers and and the people, you know, us in the commercial transaction, like made more money. Um, and I don't think that that's, that's necessarily like this ad supported business model. Like I, I ran technology at LinkedIn, like LinkedIn has a, like a very big advertising business now. And, uh, you know, like Microsoft, uh, runs, uh, runs a search engine that has, a has a big advertising business. Um, and so there's nothing wrong with advertising based business models, which heavily use machine learning to, to do what they're doing. It's just like you should understand, like when you are using a, a free service, uh, that you know the data that you are contributing back to that service by your interactions with it are being used in these machine learning models to to produce uh, value for a whole bunch of people in the you know in this advertising calculus, and like that's something to be uh, just aware of. Um, yeah, again, like if I think if I imagine myself as uh, the 12 year old Kevin who got his first color computer too back in the early 1980s. Like I would really, really much rather have the world that we have right now where there's Google and Wikipedia and like YouTube and a bunch of, uh, you know, ad supported content that I can have access to uh, that I might not otherwise have. Um, and that like my data contributions uh, I think would be a fair trade. Um, but I but I do think it's it's like 
really, uh, really important for people to sort of realize that like that's actually one of the more interesting ways to understand where data is going is just by looking at, uh, you know, who is who is making uh, money. And, and one of the things that we've looked at at Microsoft is this whole notion of um, data is labor. Like it's not a foregone conclusion that we have somehow or another been able to fairly assign an economic value to the data contributions that people are making to the technological systems that they use. Um, and so like we're trying to figure out like in Microsoft Research and in the office of the CTO, whether or not there is a principal way where we can sort of help someone understand that like I am contributing this piece of information and it has this amount of value to it. So I know, you know, if I'm getting this service back uh, from a video platform, for instance, that uh, like what I've just contributed is a fair trade. Got it. Interesting. That follows uh, another set of questions that have surfaced from the audience in and around um, sort of the, di the digital citizenship role and responsibility of the individual. Uh, and I think you touch on that nicely and also bring up a fair amount in the book relative to the political systems. So there's both the individual unit, the person, and how we can sort of spread the wealth, right? What does the educational system need to be doing? Yeah. What is the personal action that people need to be considering? And then I want to toss in just within that realm, you talk a lot about libraries uh, and the influence on you. Public libraries are everywhere in rural as well as urban settings and institutions like CHM, museum yep. institutions, so learning institutions. So there's the there's the individual citizenship role and then there's sort of the who is the royal we because those are the regulatory yep. political bodies. So could you talk a little bit about that and how we get more people to participate uh, you know, outside of the, the coast and, and raw tech, if you will? Yeah, I mean, when I look at rural America and some of the some of the things that are preventing people from more fully connecting to their digital future, it it, it oftentimes is a set of things that we, you know, here in these urban innovation centers take for granted. Um, you know, like one of them is broadband. We have 25 million people in the United States who do not have adequate access to broadband. Um, and about 15, 16 million of those people are uh, are in rural America, which means we have a substantial number of people in, uh, you know, in in urban environments who don't have access to adequate broadband. And if you think about what's going on right now with uh, with COVID nineteen, like that lack of access to broadband is a very very stark digital divide. It's like not even a theoretical thing anymore. It's like, oh, you know, can, can this community you know, uh, you know, educate their their students in public schools well enough, and you know, attract the right kind of jobs. Like now, we're talking about no internet connectivity means that your kids can't go to school at all uh, because schools are shut down and and we have virtual classrooms going. And in some cases, it prevents people from having access to the only job opportunities that exist, which are you know requiring telework. Um, so I, I think that's something that we have to really, really focus on quite seriously over the over the next uh, months and years is like getting better ubiquitous broadband connectivity uh, to the country. Because again, you know, I don't think you can't connect to the internet. You can't connect to this digital future that we hope everybody ought to be able to participate in. Um, and I think schools are super important. Like we've got a bunch of really inspiring stuff happening with uh, code.org and with programs like Teals, which is a Microsoft founded program that's trying to get AP computer science taught in every class. Uh, I'm really, really excited about the possibility here because I think in some ways machine learning is actually easier to teach as a as a set of technology skills and programming. Uh, because the tools have become so powerful that it is really becoming more and more about teaching a machine how to solve a problem in, in relatively human terms, which even a child knows how to do, versus uh, you know, versus you know, learning all of the idiosyncrasies of a complicated machine and then being able to translate a human understanding of a problem into the terms that a machine can go execute. Um, so. Yeah, it, it's 
you believe that the tools have already become far more democratized and are on like this democratizing trajectory because of open source software and public clouds and whatnot, then it really does become uh, one of these issues where you need to have role models and uh, just sort of better storytelling for kids so that they can avail themselves of resources that already exist. That's interesting. Um, along those lines, do you feel like the, the educational systems, you're really talking about sort of computational thinking versus yeah. coding, if you will. And and I'm curious about um, the types of, of uh, societal requirements from, again, educational system, regulatory oversight, large corporate multinational interests sort of defining places and domains within which individuals can train themselves or become capable of applying themselves in a way that that this future of AIs is presenting to us. Do you, do you have a sense of the actors that need to participate in that? Oh, I think it's I think it's you, you called out all of the right ones. It's sort of the individual, it's the educator, it's the policymaker, it's uh, like business community. I mean, like, a thing that's very important and not uh, not to be minimized at all is the is access to capital. Uh, so one like when I as part of writing the book went around to a bunch of these communities outside of Silicon Valley in the Puget Sound area, you, you see entrepreneurs everywhere. Like there are these industrious and genius people who are facing all sorts of problems that technology is very well suited to solving. Um, and, you know, they have all of the entrepreneurial spirit they need to go solve these problems. And in many cases, it's just they don't have the same access to, you know, abundant venture capital that uh, people here in these ecosystems that we live in do. And so, you know, I, I think that is definitely a policy in, a, initiative that we could look at. One, one of the things that I write about in the book that that I think could be really interesting is uh, our researchers and businesses are very good at responding to these grand challenge problems. So we've mm -hmm. had, we've had, you know, like the DARPA grand challenge for uh, autonomous driving basically created the entire ecosystem for self-driving cars that we have right now. So all the, the people in the Stanford and the Carnegie Mellon labs that were the, you know, the placing teams for those DARPA challenges are you know, like went off to you know Google and a bunch of other places and like now there's this whole ecosystem of self-driving car companies that like started from funding and inspiration that the government created and uh, you know you, you think even back to the 50s and 60s with the Apollo program like the entirety of the modern aerospace industry exists because we decided somewhat arbitrarily that we needed to send uh, you know, a human being to the moon. So I, I think we could pick one of those things that is like, I think we can even pick better than the moon. You could sort of say like, we want to, you know, we want to build a, an infrastructure that provides uh, ubiquitous high quality healthcare for virtually zero cost to every person in the world mm -hmm. and, and, and just dump money into it. Like, you know, a percent or two percent of GDP, I think, right. solved that problem. Uh, right. And like the the implications of that, like just like even forget about the the cost savings that you get, just the quality of life and the you know the flourishing of creativity that you get because people wouldn't have to contend with these sort of bottom tier Maslow's hierarchy things, and you know they're free to like really get after their human potential. I think it'd be amazing. Yeah, that's it's interesting. I it makes me think when you say that and you centered around some of the things that motivated the creation uh, and the essence of Silicon Valley, which was, you know, the Russians had better rockets and and we needed lighter weights. So we poured all this federal money into Silicon and it turned out that Shockley was in Palo Alto for family reasons. So as you think about the future, and you think about Silicon Valley, a question that I might ask is, you know, you've been here for the last couple decades. I think it was Macintosh that drew you out here or your initial enthusiasm for for the PC industry. Um, what role do you think the Valley will play in this changing global ecosystem? Because you point out the 
fact that there's entrepreneurial spirit everywhere across the country in these pockets. You do a really wonderful job in the book. So I'm curious about what you think Silicon Valley's role will be in another decade, within another decade. Well, I think Silicon Valley could like play one of the most critical roles in getting to this, you know, more uh, inclusive technological future that I, I think we should all want to have. Like we will have, we'll have more innovation. We will have like more civil civil society uh, if we can more equitably distribute both the participation in the creation of the technology and the gains that come from it, like through all parts of the country. And I think, you know, it is still the reality that Silicon Valley and the technology industry is leading. Like we, we're building these really amazing pieces of technology and like I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very inspired every day when I see what all of my colleagues, both at Microsoft and, you know, my, my friends at Google and my friends at Apple and my friends at Amazon and Facebook and all of the like amazing startups that are here, like just doing incredible things. Like my, my challenge to us is like, I think we do have to think outside of ourselves. So we've done such a good job building these platform technologies that everybody is using that our community is no longer Silicon Valley. Like our community is the whole world. And like, we have to think, yeah. And like, there, it's it's the whole world. And like, these are all our people. And like, we need to think very hard every day and everything we're doing, like, are we creating value for them? And are we doing things that empower them to be their best selves? Yeah, I think that's really well said. And that's one of the beautiful things in your book is you actually put uh, a flavor on it that um, speaks to your technical acumen and strength, but also recognizes the sort of the moral imperative that we have at this moment in time, because these base level technologies are so sophisticated and broad reaching that we need to click up the hierarchy, as you said, I think at another level. So. Um, you know, with that, with that in mind, I think one of the uh, important uh, essential things that we do uh, at CHM is, is we ask those who are participating in our programs to, uh, to come up with one word um, of, of inspiration uh, that they can present uh, to the audience and to aspiring uh, uh, leaders and entrepreneurs and creators. Um, so uh, I know we've asked you to do something uh, yeah. like that. And if you would, would pick up on that, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, so my, uh, yeah. my, my word is uh, curious. Uh, and you know, I, I think it is one of the very special things about this industry and about the people who gravitate towards it is there's just this incredible curiosity that people have about you know the now and the future uh and like i i hope everybody uh everybody really remembers that 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 curiosity their curiosity is the thing that increasingly is moving the future forward for for all of us and it's a it's, it's a great thing to have and it's also a very important responsibility yeah well thank you kevin and thank you, John, as well, and to our audience. Um, this is a real um, wonderful moment in time for uh, those of us uh, at the Computer History Museum. We've just embarked upon a new mission focusing on the implications of, of computing on the human condition. And, uh, and I think your book really hit the mark. And John, uh, thank you for your uh, participation and, and uh, curiosity, if you will, in questioning. Uh, and I thought you two did a, did a really terrific job. So thanks. thank you. Any thank last you. words? All right. Well, I, I, I just want to thank uh, thank you and, and Marguerite and, and John in particular. It was a pleasure meeting you. I've been reading your work for many years. Uh, it's sort of odd that this is the way that we uh, will, like, meet each other for the first time. But uh, thank, thank you so much for doing this. Right. <laughs> it, was, it was fun. Great. All right. Thank Thanks you. All.